Alice. How are you? How is Zambia? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm fine. I guess. How how are you doing with your family? Well, I'm 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 good. <laughs> nice to see you. We are spread all over the the continent. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying we are we are good. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Uh, nice to see you and and uh, welcome to this webinar. You um thank you so much. Oh, okay, all right. Hi, Anissa. How are you? Good to see you here. Hello. How, how have you been? So lovely to hear your voice again. <laughs> so lovely. Hi. Nice. How have you been? Oh, man. Much has happened. <laughs> so much has happened. Yeah. Oh. But, uh, how, are you? Okay. how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's so good to see you. Likewise. Yes. I'm glad to hear that you're well. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Looking wonderful. forward to the yeah. question. Uh, yeah, I I think it will be a hot one, uh, a very nice yeah. hot hot yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hot, yeah. hot topics. So hot topics yeah, are good. hot topics. <laughs> yes, yes, like hot topics. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be wonderful. Yeah, but it's good to see you. It's been a while. So um, yeah. yeah, I was talking about Emerge Africa just this morning. We were okay. Sharing doing All some right. sharing on online facilitation and e-teaching okay. and yeah. Okay. Let me not talk to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me yeah. Listen. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Zadok. How are you? Humphrey, welcome. I see you. Zadok, I see you. Um, you're welcome to this session. You're looking forward to a wonderful, wonderful time. You can introduce yourself um, uh, uh, in the chat um, where you're joining us from or which institution uh, you're joining us from. So that would be really nice. Hi, Zion. Is that your name? So that I don't, yeah, Zion, right? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Irene, this is Humphrey. Hi, Humphrey. Hi, Humphrey, how are you doing? Yeah, thank you for uh, the warm uh, welcome. Yeah. Yes, I'm Dr. Humphrey Danso from Ghana, University of Skill Training and Entrepreneurial Development. Okay. And I saw this uh, nice program and I wanted to be part. So that's why I have to register and join. So <laughs> you're welcome. I'm, I'm great I'm happy to be part of this important uh, webinar. Oh, welcome, Thank welcome. You. And I'm serving Kenyan coffee or tea, whoever. Uh, so feel like you're drinking Kenyan coffee or tea, so you're welcome here. Yeah. Uh, all right, thank you. <laughs> uh, Zadok, I see you from Masinde Muliro University in Kenya. Um, welcome. Uh, most people might be joining us uh, between now and five minutes uh, past, so please uh, just give us uh, your patience, be patient for just another, you know, a few minutes to let people in so that when we start, at least we have uh, most of the people so we don't go back and forth. So please be patient for um, just a two, three minutes.
And how's the weather in Kenya today, Irene? Oh, you know, global warming is real. So it's it's really hot at the coast, but the upper side of the country, you know, the, the highlands is uh, raining. I think most of the people here um, uh, can say that. Uh, whoever, yeah, Zadok is from Kenya, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been cold on the other side, but too hot here. So, and we don't have rains for a while. We, we've not had rains from last year. So it's quite, quite bad. So I hope it rains soon. It is raining here yeah, on the western part of Kenya. Yeah, so you see, so I don't know. We, we need to... Uh, uh, No, we believe in uh, confession, so we might need to confess so that we can <laughs> be forgiven. Yeah, we have a little joke where Irene always sends us rain to Wakanda <laughs> virtually. <laughs> and and sometimes I ask you to pay for it like a true Kenyan. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to just know how people are doing sometimes. Kersey, we see you. Welcome. Claudia, we see you. You're welcome. You're so welcome to this session. Um, should we start and let the others come in as we start? What do you think? Yes? Or we give it a few more minutes? Nicola, Karen, Mumpilo? Um, I think should we can we? give it a few minutes. I mean, okay, all right. But may maybe, Irene, maybe you should sing a song to keep us entertained. <laughs> No, I'm joking. <laughs> I can't sing. To, yeah. I can't. <laughs> I can't sing to save myself. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, we we always have so many um, uh, little games that we can play. But uh, I think because we only have five minutes, uh, it won't be enough. So uh, probably we do that next time. But yeah, I can't sing. Uh, but I can really lip sync. You know to all the songs <laughs> that you know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I can lip sing very well, so. Please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're joining us from. We will appreciate. I was just putting in a chat. Hello from Finland. Thanks. For oh wow! Yeah, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you're so welcome here, and and um, we were just having uh, Kenyan coffee and Kenyan tea. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, probably I should be playing some music, but we'll do that next time. It's always the next time, isn't it? <laughs> So we are just, um, I think we should start so that uh, we have more time for the session. Yeah. So yes. I will say a big, big good afternoon to everyone. My name is Irene Mawel uh, from uh, Image Africa. I am joining you from Kenya. Um, I am so delighted to uh, introduce the, this uh, session, which is for graduate supervision. Um, online during and uh, before and during the pandemic. So we have three wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, ladies that I've known for, for, for a while now, who are also my friends. And they'll be presenting today. We start with Dr. Nompilo Suma, who is from uh, Stollenbosch University in South Africa. We have Nicola Pallet from Rhodes University in also South Africa. And we have uh, Professor Karen uh, Myers Ferreira, who is from Eshwatini uh, University, which was, uh, Eshwatini is the former Swaziland. I'm sure you all know that, but I had to say it. <laughs> it, it feels nice, yeah, Eshwatini. 
Um, welcome, and I'm so happy to have you. And I think I'll hand over to the ladies and uh, we can begin now. So over to you, uh, Nicola, Karen, and Nankulu. Thank you so much, Irene. So I'm going to start us off today. I'm Nicola and just talk a little bit more about different you know, approaches to supervision. So Irene, if you can please click to the next slide. And then um, Karen will share a bit more about online you know, supervision skills. And then we'll uh, ask Nompila will be sharing some of her research with postgraduate students and their experiences of supervision during the pandemic. And then Karen was going to share her research on um, the experiences of doctoral supervisors um, and students, or just supervisors, right, Karen? Just supervisors. Okay, <laughs> cool. And then I'll be sharing some of my just experiences of different models of supervision online. Um, so not quite as rigorous as research yet, but I'm sure colleagues will find some overlaps there. Uh, just to share that, you know, online supervision can take various forms. And, you know, maybe one can think of it as approaches to supervision that have gone online. So even before online, you know, you have the traditional apprenticeship model. And then you have some alternative approaches that have been discussed for more than 10 years already. It didn't come about with the move to online, but perhaps people are just paying more attention to it now. So the traditional master apprenticeship model um, has been seen as problematic in various ways before the transition of on, to online and has had some of the chain, uh, same challenges. So for example, it can be quite lonely if postgrads are not part of a community. So it's been referred to as the lonely scholar model. Um, I think online perhaps exacerbates some of the challenges that exist with these different models. And with online, you really have to pay attention to the social relationships. And I think we're gonna see some of this reflected in the research that Karen and Nompila will be sharing with us. Uh, some alternative approaches uh, from the literature have been seminars for postgrads, structured coursework, and then also more collaborative approaches such as project teams and cohort-based cohort -based approaches. So project teams is when a student has a panel of experts, including a main supervisor, and then cohort is when you have a program of postgrad students who are researching related topics in the same field and have a cohort of peers as part of their community. Now, just to say that these collaborative approaches are quite common in the natural sciences, but very much less so in the humanities. Um, but uh, I think it is starting to emerge there as well. So next, I'm going to hand over to Karen to talk a little bit more about supervision skills. Thank you very much. But it looks like Nompilo's slide is coming up. Over. Oh, there we are. All right. OK, so in general, um, supervision skills can be applied, you know, in a traditional face to face setting, but they can also be applied in an online uh, setting. So some of the skills overlap. Um, we know that supervisors need to be accessible. They should provide reg regular positive criticism and feedback on the students' work, but also show empathy. And I think that's one of the things that we have shown very, we have seen very clearly during the pandemic, how much that empathy is really, really needed. At the same time, it's nice, it's good when supervisors can treat their doctoral students as colleagues or peers, because indeed it's often the case that we are working with our colleagues when we are supervising them. So first and foremost, of course, supervisors must support the students in their research. Uh, why do we have to underline that? Because obviously it has gone wrong in some cases. So when we look at what happens during the research phase, we can actually identify four major uh, supervisory roles or dimensions. We need to give advice. We need to do quality control. We definitely have to support our 
uh, students and we need to guide them also. So, but for all of these, I, I think you can really understand that for all of these, regular interaction is essential. Now, Wu and his colleagues in 2020 um, thought of two important uh, features that is that as supervisors in the organization we work, there has to be organizational agility. So we need to be flexible, especially when we go online, but also the supervisors themselves need to be personally agile. We need to be flexible. We need to be able to change tactics and strategies along the way. And with that being said, I'm handing over to Nompilo. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so for my slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research study that I am currently working on. Um, I'm still busy analyzing the data, but there are such interesting insights that are coming out of it that I thought it may be valuable to share with people who are interested in postgrad supervision at the moment. Um, so I ran a survey at three universities in South Africa, um, what we term research intensive universities. So those are uh, um, universities that um, really value research and support research in a lot of ways, whether it's research from academics or research from the postgraduate students, they provide resources in terms of that. And what I really wanted to find out was the experiences of postgraduate students. And when I'm saying postgraduate, I'm talking about honors, masters and PhD students in terms of supervision uh, during the lockdown. So the survey was run uh, towards the end of last year and beginning of this year. So the results are actually still quite fresh. Um, so what I'm going to show you now, um, I had about probably, I can't remember the exact number, I'm sorry, I should have checked that, but there were about 800 or so responses from um, the surveys. So what I'm going to show you on this slide, can you just click next, Irene, is the theoretical framing that I used to try and understand the data as I was analyzing it. Okay. Um, my idea was to understand how they reflected on their agency as postgraduate students. In other words, it didn't matter what, um, it didn't matter what issues or problems they were experiencing, how did that push their research forward? Okay, so this is from Margaret Archer, who talks about the internal conversation. I'm not going to go into details in terms of, of that theory, otherwise it will take us the whole presentation. But in summary, there's autonomous reflexivity where students are actually able to take independent action um, despite whatever is happening in the context. They may even at times challenge the status quo um, and challenge different st structures because they're able to think independently and do things without necessarily always relying on the supervisor. And then there's communicative um, reflexivity where their action is socially mediated. So they will take action, but they will always look out to see how their supervisor or how their peers or other people approve that particular action and, and they draw from that. Okay, and then there's fractured reflexivity where their action has been impeded or it's displaced because they are struggling to take action as a result of um, a number of different things. A lot of times it's because of a crisis that has taken place and a lot of people were in crisis during um, the pandemic. So I'm going to show you um, three quotations from the survey from three different students and um, try and frame them based on these three. So one for autonomous, one for communicative reflexivity and one for fractured reflexivity. We can go on to the next slide. Okay, please show the quotation. Okay, so this one says that my supervisor trusted me to work independently and the student really enjoyed it um, and didn't feel that they needed to report back every, every week. Um, but then at times they were worried whether they were on the right track, but that actually motivated them um, because they gained more confidence in their abilities and learned to trust their guts. Okay, so 
at times it, it was a good thing that they had the independence and at times they felt it was a bad thing that they had the independence. Um, please, can you just click next? I think the quotation carries on. And then the student just goes on to elaborate how if they had been in the same building, it would have been easier because they struggled to ask certain questions via email, which would have been quite easy to ask face to face. But the important thing to draw out of um, this particular response is that this student managed to work independently and the supervisor trusted the student to work independently. And though there were challenges and struggles with that, the student actually was able to build confidence in terms of their research as a result of the independence that they were given. Please go to the next slide. Okay, and click next. In communicative re reflexivity, um, this particular student expresses how not being on campus was really difficult. As you can see, this is someone in mechanical engineering. They say we understand the helpfulness and encouragement. Sorry, we underestimate the helpfulness and encouragement of our peers. Um, and the student has gone back to postgrad offices now and is really feeling um, that collaboration and being part of something. And they're getting support and advice from peers. Um, and they're also able, they're talking about being quickly able to pop into the workshop and ask other members of staff uh, in terms of how to proceed. So a lot of what this student actually gets from the supervision relationship isn't always just from the supervisor, but it's from peers, it's from people in the workshop, it's from people in the engineering store and so on. So it's a very communicative kind of reflexivity. Please go to the next slide. Okay, and then the last one looks at fractured reflexivity where a student really struggled. Um, it frankly feels like you do not have a supervisor, particularly with me because everything was online. My supervisor was almost always busy and never really availed themselves fully when it came to my research. They only wanted the final product. The comments that they gave were not substantive enough um, for something that had been sent without a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, also, because I never met my supervisor in person, a lot would be lost in translation and tones were misunderstood, thus creating an uncomfortable environment to ask questions freely. So in effect, it became really difficult for this student to take action in terms of their research, because a lot of times they wouldn't understand what the supervisor has asked them to do, um, when they try to ask something, sometimes the tone would get misunderstood and so on. Um, so that is an example of fractured reflexivity. Okay, I think I'm done for now. So that's back to me. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, participate in what is called the DS Crest um, it's like a summer school or it's a course for doctoral student supervisors. And it was held online this, this particular year, which is 2020 uh, because of the pandemic. And um, one of the requirements in that uh, program is uh, a short research project. So I personally wanted to find out whether there had been transformation due to the pandemic. What happened before the onset of the pandemic? What happened during the pandemic? So I uh, phrased a couple of research questions. Uh, how often did supervisors see their students face to face before the pandemic? What were the means of communication before? What were the means of communication during the pandemic? And what video conferencing tools were used to continue interacting during the pandemic? So also whether there was um, a, a difference in frequency of supervisor, supervisee interaction. Um, finally, I did also something about the VIVA and the oral thesis defense, but I'm not going to delve into that one here. Um, it was a mixed method research approach. I uh, used a questionnaire with closed and open-ended questions. Um, I selected, purposely selected 311 participants and 63 responded, or rather, let's say 63 responses were useful, were workable. 
um, we noted that the majority of these participants supervised between one and three doctoral students, but there were six colleagues who supervised between seven and 10 doctoral candidates. And I, for me personally, I think that's an indication of a serious work overload. Uh, I really, we can go to the next slide. So what did we see? Okay, before the pandemic, um, participants used this to see their PhD students face to face um, once a month. Yeah, that was the vast majority, as you can see, almost 68%. The change um, was clear because uh, the blue part on the bottom uh, pie chart shows that the interactions were less frequent. So that was the majority, but you can see it's kind of divided there. So some were saying the frequency hasn't changed. Some, the majority were saying they are less frequent, but there were also people who were saying they were more frequent. So those are interesting points, Irene. Can we go to the next slide? Right, so the interactions before the onset of the pandemic were uh, vastly, the vast majority happened face to face, almost 71%. A lot of work was already done via email, as you can see, a little over 20%, but there was already work done via Skype. I mean, I know my student is in another country. I had one last year. We were interacting already via email and Skype mostly. Now, look at what happened when the pandemic started and continued. The face-to-face -face bit went almost to zero. Yeah, I think it really depended on the countries because it was people uh, responding from all over Africa and even some beyond. So I think the face-to-face -face component almost disappeared. Email became important uh, mostly, but also Skype or similar platforms started to be used more frequently. And in the next slide, we actually look at um, the type of tools that were used. Uh, the vast majority were Zoom, just like we are doing today. It seems to be kind of the preferred um, video conferencing tool at the moment. But also Google Hangout, Google Meet was used, and Microsoft Teams. A few other smaller ones, Adobe Con Con Connect was used, and then uh, people were using WhatsApp and the call feature for WhatsApp. So that was also quite interesting uh, to see which tools we really used. We can continue to the next slide. Um, so now, okay, fine. We are using different tools. We are interacting with our students a little bit less frequently, but we're still doing that. What has happened? How, has, how have they been able to progress? Now, this is seen, of course, from the supervisor's side. We, I did not interact with students, so they might have felt something completely different. That is a, a, a different story altogether. 33.3% um, thought that the doctoral students had progressed more intensely. Um, but almost a similar amount, 30.3%, where it became less intense, and a similar amount again, where it remained similar. I think what is also important is that quite a number of them stopped progressing altogether. Now, this needs to be compared, of course, with numbers from before the pandemic. I haven't done that yet. Um, because we know that doctoral students drop out. It does happen. So can we go to the next slide, please? I think this is where um, I, I got the doctoral supervisors to talk a little bit on how they perceived what was going on. So one, one, of, one of them was saying, it's very difficult to transform from a three-dimensional human face-to-face -face contact to a two-dimensional screen exchange. And for that particular a respondent, human communication was kind of lost. While so the several supervisors noted progress also in the way they were communicating and how frequently they were communicating, because at the beginning of the pandemic, communication was irregular, difficult. People were dealing with all kinds of issues. 
uh, psychological issues, but also technological issues. But after some time, both the students and the supervisors seem to have adapted and changed the ways in which they interacted and did research. One of the researcher in natural sciences had this to say, it has been challenging to work with students under restriction measures taken by the government. At the beginning, so that was March last year, since everything was closed, laboratory work stopped. A month later, when we got used to the measures, students resumed lab, but the intensity was very low and our communication happened only via phone calls and WhatsApp. The participant recommended the students to read more, designed experiments to be carried out when the situation would uh, improve. And, and so uh, some of the manipulations were not carried out at that particular moment. So that delayed some of the research work or asked the participants to really adapt the way and the type of research they were doing. I think we can go to the next slide and I'll be handing over to Nompilo. Thank you, Karen. Um, so <clears throat> what I'll present in the next two slides is actually a continuation of the results from the study that I spoke about earlier. So here the students were speaking very specifically about um, technology and how it helped to mediate the supervisory relationships. Um, Please don't open all of them yet. Just two for now is fine. I'll let you know when to open the others, Irene. Thank you. Um, so the important thing to remember before I start going through uh, these points that are listed on this slide is that most students were very, very appreciative of what their supervisors have done for them during the pandemic. Um, and they spoke about the different workshops that the supervisors had organized. Um, caring not just for their research but also for their emotional and mental well-being they spoke about how they now had even better access to their supervisors than they did before because the supervisors insisted on giving them their whatsapp numbers and so on and were available to respond to them any time so they, they really spoke quite a, a lot of students spoke about strengthening of the supervisory relationship as a result of the pandemic. There were challenges, of course, but most of the, the participants in the study spoke very positively about what the supervisors had actually done for them. So what I've done on this slide is to highlight um, those things that maybe didn't go so well. Um, and I, I, I really liked the idea or the fact that students were quite open um, I, I was worried that they would just paint this terrible picture in terms of the supervisors and just complain and complain and complain. But a lot of times for some of these quotes, unfortunately, I couldn't put full quotations for all of them. Even if they wrote about a particular problem, they would go on to explain. Um, actually, I understand that my supervisor is super busy and doesn't have the time um, my supervisor is homeschooling, my supervisor is this. So in effect, while they would state the problem, it felt for, for quite a, a few of them that they understood why. Um, and, and yeah, so it, it was interesting to note that. Okay, so the first one listed there talks about the importance of training. And this is an honest student. Um, and, and the fact that the supervisors didn't really manage the, the course part of, 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 um, of, of their work very well. Um, and the student was disappointed in how they actually performed at the end of the year. Um, so this is something that we as supervisors and people working with students need to really think about in terms of the kind of training that we have access to. Um, the next one speaks to email responses, and that while technology did help, the response timing was not ideal, um, and that it would be easier to ask for and understand advice in person. And this is also an honest student, but who was in accounting. Next point, please. You can put, I think, the rest of the points. It's fine. I think there's two more. There's one more after this one. Okay. 
It is extremely difficult to switch to online work because of the particular topic that the student has. And while the supervisor may have organized some reading groups and some other support, they may have been interesting, but they were not always helpful to the students. So it's important when we organize extra support for the students that we ensure it actually meets their needs um, and assist them to move their research forward. And this is from a PhD student in arts. Um, the next one is, is about supervisors who gave contradictory feedback, um, but the supervisors refused to have meetings in person or virtually and insisted on communicating via email only, which made it difficult for the students to then know um, what direction they should take and which advice they should take. I think there's one more point, Irene. Um, I've noticed that my supervisor was already very busy before lockdown was now even more busy uh, because she had to create online materials. So it's interesting that while technology was used to mediate the supervisory relationship, technology was also responsible for taking the supervisor away from her supervisory duties because now her teaching load um, was more than she could handle. And because that was more urgent, the teaching is usually more urgent than the research or the supervision, then that took up all of her focus. Okay, and then the next slide. Okay, so the key takeaways from um, the postgraduate student research uh, at these three universities is that I've already mentioned that it's, it's interesting the keen insight that students had in terms of the extra teaching pressure that uh, on, on supervisors. Um, they were very appreciative of the availability of the supervisors, despite the fact that they had extra responsibilities and their homeschooling and that kind of thing. Um, they were appreciative of timely and helpful feedback. Uh, for feedback that is received but can't actually be used because it's not, not substantive enough, that made it even more difficult because there were no in-person meetings to actually explain that feedback really well. They also appreciated mental and emotional uh, health support that they got from their supervisors. And a lot of them, not a lot, but a few of them also understood that these supervisors also had their own mental and emotional health challenges, but would actually set aside time to uh, assist students with that, or at least direct them to places where they could get that kind of support. Um, they really thrived on online support communities with their other peers. Um, and, and this was, it was interesting, this was particularly true for part-time students who usually did not have access to um, university workshops and seminars um, and didn't have access to their other peers, at least not regular access. So they really felt that because of the pandemic, a lot of these communities and webinars and seminars and training took place online. So they now also had support which they didn't have before. Um, and then there, there was also a very strong theme that came out about the importance of supervisors understanding that different students work in different contexts at home. Um, so not everyone has got a nice office space or a nice little room where they can sit on their own. There are students who are also managing uh, work programs and homeschooling and they have screaming children around them as they're trying to do their PhD research. So they, they, they really appreciated it when, when there was that understanding. And then the last point there is around supervisor expectations uh, and the fact that sometimes supervisors expected more than the students could give uh, and which, which sometimes incapacitated the students and made them feel um, they actually won't be able to do it or they won't be able to make it. Thank you. Thank you, Nompila and Irene um, and Karen. So I also did a course at Rhodes. It was called the Strengthening Postgraduate Supervision Course. And as part of that course, we have to had to reflect about our supervision practices, but also, you know, it sort of encourages you beyond the course to continue to reflect on your practices. 
Uh, and I really do encourage colleagues to take up opportunities, whether it's at your institution or whether it be by, you know, via resources you find online to actually, you know, take the time to, you know, read up about supervision practices and online supervision. I did find online supervision in particular to be a gap in the course and that I had to do my own sort of reading around the topic. So I'm going to just share some of my experiences and reflections um, because my current supervision arrangements have actually led me to reflect on the different kinds of supervision models. So just stories from sort of three students that I'm currently supervising. So I see there's a big need for flexibility um, and alternative approaches to, to supervision. And that this was present uh, before the pandemic. Um, and online forms part of these arrangements in different ways. So I've got student one who is doing online masters. It's a structured program at another university that's cohort based, cohort based and the students actually have to go out and pick their own supervisors. Uh, and then you work with a supervisor at the host institution where the student is doing um, her, their studies. Um, and what, what's nice about it, though, is that the student actually has peers uh, from a cohort, um, which I find, you know, it's quite fascinating, but it's also, you know, it has its own challenges. Then student two is a pre-doc, she's doing a PhD program, and there's structured support as part of a project team. And this program was originally designed to be blended, but then went fully online uh, when we went into lockdown. So your project teams depend on the expertise and the research interests of the supervisors across, you know, the two universities that are collaborating on this program, and then the super the students topic. The student has peers, their structured support, and then a project team has a main supervisor and co-supervisors. Then student three is on campus. Uh, and has a co-supervisor online with niche expertise, but it's mainly, if I have to describe the approach, it's a master apprentice approach. And this is someone, you know, colleague, and I think for this student, there is actually a community, even though we have a you know, master apprentice approach. Um, colleagues who are PhD students, our department organizes doc weeks. So while, you know, there's not a particular cohort, I think, you know, he does have a community. So for student three, um, we chose a partially online approach so that we could work with a supervisor who has the expertise we want, but who, unfortunately, we don't have someone like that at our university. So we had to look beyond. Uh, all three of my students work in higher education and need different forms of flexibility. So student one, for example, had enrolled for a master's program at other universities twice before her current program and she was unable to continue her studies as it coincided with the births of her first two children. Uh, she now has baby number three and said she's able to cope much better given that the program is online. Uh, from my experience, online supervision across these three situations is quite different um, as there are different approaches, but I think what is common across them is supervision skills and developing pedagogies around online supervision. Student two, um, for student two, I'm part of her project team, but not the main supervisor. Uh, the project team's approach is quite new to me. Uh, for student one, I rely on the co-supervisor at the host institution, and sometimes, you know, often the student for admin procedures. So it's quite different to supervising at one's own institution where you have supervision guidelines and processes that you become familiar with and more deeply so um, over time. Okay, next slide, please, Irene. So even though there are, you know, these different supervision models or approaches, I think the dimensions of supervision is uh, common irrespective of the approach. It might just take different forms. For example, supervisors' knowledge and skills, which we see in Lee's framework, um, might be thought of differently in a master apprenticeship one-on-one -on -one approach compared to supervision that is part of a project team. Supervision, thinking of supervision as social relationships is key. And these relationships are, you know, they are always two-way. And for this to work, you know, 
you know, we need to encourage students to take agency. And I think this develops over time as students gain more confidence. Uh, we can use these dimensions to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of supervisor am I? Uh, what kind of supervisor would I like to be? Perhaps I need to operate at different dimensions at different times, depending on the stage of the student's research journey. Maybe you using different dimensions at the same time, um, depending on where the student is. So you can use this framework as a nice tool for self-reflection and you know, for reflecting on your supervision practices and processes. Um, next slide, please, Irene. So Lee's conceptions also influence the kind, so the, her conceptions of supervision influence the kinds of online tools that supervisors might use as part of the supervision process. So if we think about the kinds of activities that students and supervisors need to engage in, and then think about suitable tools. So as part of online supervision, you could actually have a range of tools, but the purpose you are using these for actually need to be clear to both the student and the supervisor. Sometimes there are also things that you need to negotiate and adapt between you. For example, if someone's, uh, you know, Zoom is blocked in their work environment, you might need to use an alternative online meeting tool. Um, I think as much as supervisors require training and support to improving their supervision practices, using technology better to support supervision activities is also part of this. Um, I've met quite a few supervisors who only email or use, for example, MS Teams projects for students and the postgrad students uh, do not have their number. There's no communication via WhatsApp, for example. Um, but for me personally, and I mean, this is just me reflecting on and expanding on these conceptions and then you know just, just sharing some of the different tools that I use for me WhatsApp is actually quite important and, and my student and I one of my students we find it really useful um, we use email like most people and online meeting tools Google Drive word files with track changes and these are very formal things but I think our informal WhatsApp interactions also help a lot to mediate and motivate those formal activities. Um, so sometimes it can be something just checking in, you know, how are you doing? Or earlier today, she said, you know, I'm making good progress on my chapter four. Um, so that was, you know, always, sometimes it's not like you're checking in and playing a big brother role. It's much more conversational, um, which can be quite nice. So yeah, just something I thought folks would find useful. And then in the remainder of the slides, you'll see some interesting link, links to articles uh, that you can read about online supervision, supervision approaches. Um, and, you know, one, there's some on you sort of, you know, so, uh, about the benefits of community and collaborative approaches to supervision, which you can take a look at. And then the other the one is around resources. So after articles of interest, we've got resources for interest. So that is the first one is a link to the program that I am um, part of the, one of the project teams on. And then there's a postgrad collaboration site, which has links for three courses, creating postgraduate collaborations, strengthening postgraduate supervision and enhancing postgraduate environments. Um, and then a little video on uh, where people are reflecting on their experiences, both supervisors and students, um, on working as part of pro a project team. Because I realize for many colleagues, you know, including myself, this might be quite new. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks everyone. Um, and we're looking forward to your questions. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation and, and wonderful insights into um, online supervision or postgraduate supervision. And there's been a lot of conversation in the chat. Are there things that uh, the presenters would like to pick up and speak on from, from the chat? Um, I can pick up on <clears throat> uh, Humphrey's comment earlier. 
He says, I think laboratory-based research activities were highly affected during the COVID-19 pandemic period. And I just want to support that. That's one thing that came out quite clearly, quite strongly from the research. Those who were doing any lab-based kind of research were really affected um, and had to actually pause their research studies. Some had, um, had, because they had to leave immediately, some of them had their research actually destroyed or where things went bad and so on because they were not allowed on campus at all. But it's also interesting that other kinds of research suffered because those who needed to do any face-to-face -face kind of research also had to pause it or to change it completely. So some students indicate there that they moved from um, face-to-face -face interviews and they just left it completely and they had to do there's one student who says that uh, they had to do um, a, a survey kind of of, of research um, sorry uh, yeah a literature survey kind of research a literary review rather kind of research because it just wasn't possible uh, and the student would have had to go into the community so it wasn't a, a group of people who should have been able to interview online. So there are other kinds of research that also suffered as well, not just the lab-based research studies. Oh, thank you. I, I, in, in, in your presentations, uh, you, you spoke about mental health and, and self-care. Um, how did you find that affecting what you were doing uh, or how did it affect uh, the research that you did or the responses that you got. Um, perhaps it's all to all the, the to Karen, to Nonthilo and to Nicola. Um, if you allow me, Irene, I, I think, yes, I mean, I, I think we mustn't underestimate the, the impact the pandemic has had on all of us. Um, most of us, I think, now have shorter fuses. We might be getting a little um, more impatient or impatient at a faster rate. So all that, I think, as supervisors, we really need to, to remember that we are all together in this difficult situation. So to remind us, you know, to take a step back when we have maybe um, negative reactions and just you know, try and rephrase them, reformulate what we are going to express and, and, and really let empathy uh, and sympathy shine through. Um, I think also what came out in, in, in the chat is that um, there is a lot more research that needs to be done in this area uh, because the long-term uh, consequences, the long-term impact uh, will be quite severe, I think. So we really need to work on that. Thank you. Yeah, if I can share as well, I had a student, one of my students had a death in the family as a result of COVID and, you know, shared about it on WhatsApp with me. And I said, look, it's family time now. Your, your studies, you know, it's totally understandable that the studies take a back seat. And just, you know, it's informal, but that kind of support, you know, when you're a supervisor, you're also sharing, you're trying to provide emotional support. Um, so, yeah, as, as Karen was saying, we, we can't ignore that the pandemic is, is and has had a lot of impact on people's lives. Can we perhaps ask, you know, some of the participants, um, you might be supervising, you know, masters, doctoral students, how have you lived through or, or how are you living through the pandemic? How are those relationships with your students uh, evolving? Can you share maybe a little bit from your side? We would appreciate that. Yeah, maybe while someone wants to take the mic. Yeah. 
Perhaps I can put Gabriel on the spot. I don't know if you can hear me, Gabriel. I know you do a bit of supervision or a lot of it. Would you like to speak? Oh, it's really putting me <laughs> on the spot. Yes, I, yeah. uh, I can I only do that because <laughs> you're my friend. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway, for me, it's like the students are already learning by distance learning. So, well, there's no change, so to speak. Uh, normally, for those like those I supervise who are in Zambia, in Lusaka in particular, I immediately I'm given a student to supervise. I would um, arrange for a face to face meeting. Then, thereafter, it would be normally meeting online and arranging for for times to, to answer them uh, when they have issues. But what I found helpful is uh, really to give them that uh, liberty, unless I see that someone is struggling. So I'll share with them some links and uh, point them to literature that would help them in, in their writing. Uh, but basically it's to arrange for scheduled meetings at least once every month or once every two weeks, depending on the student. Uh, I've had some who are really self-driven and don't need much support, but some who need more, more support. And sometimes just every other day or every week, just checking on them by WhatsApp, find out what's happening. And uh, really having that social presence, even if I'm not there with them. But I've had those who are from outside Zambia, South Africa mostly, few from Malawi and uh, Eswatini. Yeah, it can be a bit of a challenge, especially when they are quite far, but again, I try to really show that I'm there for them and uh, ask them to get in touch with me at any time if they want to, me to assist them. Yeah, so basically, that's what I would, I want to say. Oh, thank you, Gabriel. <laughs> for accepting my putting you on the spot and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, mm -hmm. It is through these stories that we share that we, we actually realize that we are not on our own and we are not alone. So thank you, I appreciate you. There is a question from Claudia. I'm sure the presenters have, have picked that up. Uh, which aspects of pandemic supervision are likely to continue and which will go back to the pre uh, pandemic norms? Uh, would you like to respond to that? Um, I can give that a go. I, I think what the pandemic has shown us is that we really shouldn't be relying, as, as Nicola has said already in the chat, on one particular tool, on one particular strategy. And so I think the pandemic really has underscored the need for us to really uh, broaden our resource field, look for alternative ways, look for uh, maybe also try to better understand our doctoral candidates. And I think the pandemic has given us that opportunity. That's from my side. I'd like to support what Karen is saying. I, I actually worry that um, prior to the pandemic, supervision wasn't the best that it could be anyway. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to go back to pre-pandemic norms. I mean, there's a lot of research around issues with the supervisory relationship, uh, the throughput rate in terms of who finishes and who drops out and the kinds of students who succeed in different disciplines. So in particular disciplines, um, certain students will succeed and others won't and so on. Uh, so already uh, what, what I think the pandemic has actually shown us is highlighted some of those issues which were there before and it's a challenge to us to actually rethink what supervision is and, and, and really rethink how to approach it humanly and in an ethical way in order to support our students better. Yeah, I also think there's been, you know, gender differences reported. Uh, Jonathan Janssen did a study of, um, you know, the outputs and sort of experiences of female academics and how this has really, you know, the pandemic and given their responsibilities at, at home has influenced their 
abilities to engage in research. And I think this is particularly probably mirrored um, in, you know, female students, you know, who we are uh, supervising and their experiences. And I think what, what I've enjoyed though about the pandemic is people have been asking more, you know, how are you doing? And are you okay? And I think if we continue that and paying attention to the affective dimension like Numpila and Karna also mentioned, the importance of those social relationships. Um, yeah, I really hope that that continues. There are some things that of course people want to, you know, hope to all go back to normal, whether it's, you know, access to labs to do work, research work, uh, also those in education who need access to schools um, to, you know, engage in particular, you know, do observations and focus groups with teachers and those kinds of things who, you know, teachers who might not have access to good bandwidth and be able to do things online. But I think for many, there's also been a lot of adapting and thinking, well, how, if it's possible, could we do an online interview or could we could we maybe do do things a little differently um i know there was always a big emphasis on surveys especially with people who maybe didn't have uh, good access to bandwidth using online survey tools that now you know might have done paper-based that are now looking at you know what are the low resource online survey tools that they could use Yeah, good comment here. Ethical issues. Oh, Alice is asking, can you share your experiences on quality issues related to research methodology and possibly ethics issues? Oh, that's a big one, hey? Of course, with the ethical issue, I suppose, doing research at this time, um, you know, advising students. And I mean, if you're going to, I know with my own research, if you're interviewing students, you know, what is the best time? Of course, you know, you're not going to, if it's before an exam time, it might not be the best time for them. Are you actually creating unrealistic expectations for them to participate in an online interview? So we've got to think not just ourselves as researchers, but also for our students. Um, what is ethical research? at this point in time and which methods would be appropriate. Karen or Pilar, anything you want to add to that question? Yeah. Well, I to, uh, go, go ahead, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, I wanted to say, um, in addition to that, um, from my research, I actually found that there are quite a number of students who had to go and reapply for ethical clearance because the studies that had originally been approved were now not possible under the, the new COVID-19 lockdown regulations. Um, so while some had to change their studies, others had to go and reapply. And even though they had been in the middle of the um, data collection, that was actually really affected uh, as a result. That's the comment that I wanted to add. Thanks, and I, I, I mean, I, I am in full agreement that there are definitely um, ethical issues that we need to think about, um, but also with regard to quality issues. I mean, for me, the quality issue is not particularly linked to the pandemic. The quality issue should always be there. Um, you know, whether we are working online or not, I think, you know, quality is what we try to achieve. So for me, at that particular level, there shouldn't be much interference. But I don't know, maybe my colleagues have a different point of view. Yeah, I think there's so much emphasis on quality when it comes to online and people have questions about quality, but don't give adequate scrutiny to what's happening uh, you know, offline and face to face, and that has been happening for a very long time traditionally, that might not have been working anyway. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any other? I know we are on the hour. Uh, we will 
take probably one or two questions. Uh, for those who need to go, I've shared a few links where you can give us feedback uh, about the session and um, feel free to let us know uh, what you feel about the session openly. Uh, if you want to be um, a member or join the community in Facebook for Image Africa, I've shared a link there. And also if you want to know more about Image Africa, uh, I've also shared a link. Uh, we'll take up uh, two or so questions and uh, uh, we'll be ending very soon because it was one hour uh, session. So I can see there are a few more uh, um, questions or comments in the, in the chat. I Irene. Irene, I think the, the one that has just been put is an interesting one about the the oral or the viva defense, um, yes. oral defense or the viva. Yes. Um, I, I, for me, there is no reason why this cannot happen in an online environment, um, as long as people have, you know, connections that are, you know, working well enough. And that still is a major issue in our community. So we mustn't minimize the issue of connectivity, data usage, data cost. But um, it can happen in an online environment. We can have a Skype meeting, we can have a Zoom um, platform that is used. I think the one good thing about it being online is that we can now look for uh, examiners that uh, are all over the world that previously might not have, for financial reasons, might not have been able to come to our countries and sit in for a defense, but that can now be examining the candidate, you know, th through these platforms. So I think that there's quite, quite uh, uh, something to be done about it. And I also like what Nicola is putting up that um, for some, the online defense might be less stressful. For others, though, I think the technological, uh, the screen issue and stuff like that might add stress. So again, um, it might be different for different candidates. I mean, we've had uh, interesting experiences with online defenses in our faculty. Um, there was a student who failed to connect completely um, and the committee waited and waited and eventually the supervisor phoned the student and put the student on speaker <laughs> and we could hear the student uh, on Microsoft Teams via the supervisor's phone and it worked fine. It wasn't as clear, of course, as if the student had been able to connect. But I think there are always ways around it to support students who maybe who may not have um, adequate data and so on in order to connect. And I think it is our responsibility as supervisors, particularly for a stressful experience like uh, your 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 defense, um, the defense of your your thesis, your viva, to actually find ways to be supportive. Um, thank you so much for the contributions and, and um, for the wonderful, wonderful uh, presenters. I, I think we could have some parting shots as we call them. What, what is it that you can advise those who are coming into supervision or those who are going to be supervised? What, what are the thing, what are that one thing that you'd uh, want to tell them. We start with Nompilo, then we go to Karen, and then we come to Nicola. Uh, my closing comments. Okay, um, I think it's just really important for us as supervisors to be sensitive of our students' context um, and get to know our students. I know, I mean, Karen mentioned earlier on that for some of the research she had done, some of the people actually end up with a lot of students that they are supervising. But even in those instances, I think it's important to get some level of understanding because that is the only way we'll be able to find ways to tailor make the support that we give to the student so that um, the support that they get is actually valuable and will help them move forward in their studies. 
um, from my side, uh, what I kind of appreciate is the fact that when you go online and when you discover all these different tools that exist, um, it gives both the supervisor and the student added uh, benefits. I, I want to give one small example. Today, we are recording what we're doing. This means that tomorrow I can come back and listen to this again. When I interact with my student and what we are discussing is recorded, it can be used again and again. So that is my parting shot. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, there's no one approach to online supervision it can take many, many forms, um, but whichever form, you know, be human, uh, be responsive to your student needs and also, you know, adapt where necessary and use tools appropriately um, and have realistic expectations, I think. Um, see, and what, what students, I guess, you know, if, if sometimes it's very good to have that online meeting for them to think through and talk through their thinking. Um, so sometimes, yeah, I, I guess, I guess it's, you know, at what point do you use what I think don't maybe don't just always focus on the tool, but think about your practices as, as part of a broader, you know, online supervision pedagogy and what you can do to support your students. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we come to the end of our session. I think we'll stay behind for a few more minutes for any questions that someone might um, want to ask. Uh, but for those who have to go, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was a great, great session, we must say. And uh, thank you for uh, your time. And we'll see you again. We'll keep on sharing um, our events. And if you want to join our community, please follow us on, 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 on Facebook and read about us in the link that I shared. Uh, for now, thank you on behalf of the presenters and on behalf of Image Africa. And have a good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, we'll stay for a while uh, so that whoever has a question can ask, but then uh, we'll be uh, finishing very soon on the uh, social side. Thank you and bye for now. So if anyone has a, a, um, a, a banning uh, personal question to the presenters, you can uh, still ask. Especially for those who came a little later when the, the uh, presentation had moved on, as you can see from the presentation that, uh, and the link was shared by Nicola Alia. If you'd like to ask anything, you can pick up your mic and just ask, please. Thanks, Irene. This is Silvanus. Hi. Yes, please. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Sorry, I missed the, the link. I came in a bit late, but I, I missed the link. The rest of it, I got quite clearly. I'm, I'm oh, happy. OK, yeah. OK. Yeah. We share the link. It's it's just been shared by Nicola. Ah, OK. Yes, right there. Yeah. It's a bit late, let me, yeah. Let me check again. Thank you. Oh, no problem. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, just something I thought I'd add that I put in the chat is that, you know, we're never experts. You're always learning and growing. Um, you know, you sometimes you think people that have been doing supervision for a very, very long time, you know, are such good supervisors. But even though they've been doing it for a, a long time, doesn't always mean that they have the best practices. Um, and it's also really useful to continuously reflect on our practices and grow and share our practices as part of a broader community. So I think if colleagues can continue to have conversations about supervision, you know, whether it's with fellow colleagues, um, that's also really, really important.
I, I think Nicola, yes, because I, I I think people should know that there's someone else who is also doing what they're doing and be able to ask questions or be able to consult or be able to just share experiences. And, and it's good that um, we have brought up this, this uh, discussion now uh, so that the conversation can go on. And, and perhaps as we move forward, we can you know, find a, a platform where people can come in and share, especially in, in our Facebook page for those who are in Facebook. Um, I'll also share the link from the YouTube recording and you can also come there and, and you know, add your thoughts or, or even resources that you found somewhere that we didn't share uh, in the presentation. So that would be really, really good. I think this is also something that um, the, the, the pandemic has brought about. I mean, we are now much more active on on this these types of platforms uh, we interact on a more regular basis that's the feeling i get and i i appreciate that very much you know there are uh, environments I, I think for a long time you know especially people in higher education worked in a very isolated manner i think um even though we couldn't physically meet it has forced us to find other ways to meet and i i, I appreciate that Yes, the, the platforms and the spaces that we have are so rich and um, it, it's really different from before the pandemic. And, and those are the, you know, what I call the silver lining in the cloud, because I, I think some of the good side of, of, um, of the pandemic are showing in, in the way we interact with each other and, and in the spaces and the communities that have been created. Uh, during this time. So yes, I also am grateful for that too. Mindful, of course, that um, we are, as we are here in a, in a privileged situation. I mean, we have, um, either we have Wi-Fi or we have data access, you know, those are all things that we sometimes forget that there are still many, many people who can't access those tools and those platforms. So, so yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I think this conversation will go on for a while. Um, I'm sure we might even think up another uh, time to discuss further on, on uh, uh, online supervision. So, Thank you everybody for coming and I think we'll end the session now and good evening and uh, good afternoon wherever you are and let's keep the fire burning. It's a good fire. Thank you colleagues and thank you Irene for your expert facilitation as always. Bye bye everyone. Keep well everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.